You know, you look at me, you're like, really? I would have never guessed, you know, that you have body problems. When it came to sex, I didn't think that I had a say. Like, I felt like my body was something that was supposed to be used for other people to enjoy. For other people to feel pleasure. For other people to feel laughter when they want to make fun of me. Like, I never really felt like my body was mine. What's up, it's your boy Tariq Ali, and welcome back to your boy's channel. How you doing, how you feeling? Um, today maybe, this video may be really heavy. Um, oh sorry, I didn't even say how I was doing. Clearly you can see that I'm in my head. Today we're gonna be talking about something that, um, it's really heavy for me and it's gonna be really heavy for a lot of people that's watching as well. Today we're gonna be talking about my self-hate, my body dysmorphia, and where it comes from. Um, I did some deep analyzing of my own self-hate and I want to share that process of how I did it um, and what I found out. I wanna give another trigger warning because we're gonna be talking about a lot of things that um, is really heavy. <laughs> I just have to read it. It's pretty heavy. Um, but I had these conversations with myself. I dig deep within myself and I learned so many things about myself that is helping me become a better person and become stronger and to love myself more. And y'all know what I'm all about here on my channel. Transparency and opening up about these things so that I can encourage other people to do the same. Mm, calm down. <laughs> so that I can encourage other people to do the same. You guys know that I don't ever come here to be right. I come here to share my experiences, but when I share my experience, I usually like to share it and then also give you some tools after to be able to help you. And I've talked about, you know, self-hate and body dysmorphia and all of that on my channel before, but I feel like this is the first time where I actually reached a point where I'm like, wow, I can share this because it can help other people. But with that being said, if you don't know me, my name is Tariq Ali. <laughs> And I'm excited because this is the very first episode of a new series that I'm bringing to my channel that is about body and health. Like I said, this isn't my first time talking about body or health on my channel, but this is the very first time that I'm starting a series that focuses on body and health. If you want to keep track of this video and where this goes and all of the different topics that we talk about when it comes to body and health, head over to my playlist and you will see it there. But um, yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna move over there. Y'all know I go over there, make my drink, and then we talk. So I'm gonna go over there, make my drink, and then we can get down to it. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I thought I wasn't, but I'm nervous. Okay, so today we're gonna be drinking um, I'm real jittery. Oh, okay. Um, I'm nervous. Oh, why am I nervous? Don't. Mm -mm. Okay, I was good before. I was ready. <laughs> I was good. Okay, um, today we're gonna be drinking Pinot Noir. Um, and this is from Vent JS, Vent Sonoma Coast. I've n I don't even know where this is from. Okay, so there's a reason that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more nervous than you guys may usually notice me. <laughs> um, if you notice, I only speak about like my body dysmorphia or my body in general, like once a year, like I speak about it on Twitter and on Instagram and captions and stuff. Like I'm not like, I'm open about it, but I don't do too many videos about it. Um, and the main reason for that is I don't usually like doing videos unless I have figured out something, okay? I don't wanna just come here um, and share my own experience and trigger thousands of people um, without giving them the tools on how to move forward. And yes, I know for some videos there's like, you know, you could just share your experience and people like to feel like they, they're not alone. And that is important, but um, I don't know, for me personally, I just think it's very important that I give tools to the people that watch me because, some, and, and I'm not the like, and I don't have the answer to everything. I always say that I never come here to be right. Um, I just come here to start the conversation. Um, but there, that's the reason I'm, I'm so nervous right now um, is because, I don't know, it's been a long time coming with me and my self hate and my body. Um, and it, it, it's a fight that I'm still fighting, right? Oh, it's too early to cry. Um, it's a fight that I'm still fighting. Um, and so it's kind of hard to come back and tell you how the fight went when it's still happening. Um, so when it comes to self-hate, I've talked about this on my channel before. You guys know I had some sense of hatred towards my being black and what came with that. Um, the way that I was treated by white people, going to school with white people, um, and how I started internalizing a lot of the thoughts that were like put on to me. Um, so there was my skin color, there was my queerness. Um, I've been like feminine my entire life. Um, I love doing things that were for girls when I was younger. Um, and I, I was just always a feminine person, but I was way more feminine when I was younger because I just felt way more comfortable with women and I identified more with women than I did with men. And then the other thing, um, 
was my body. I grew up obese. That's what the doctor told me. <laughs> Every time that I say that, I always gotta say that's what the doctor told me. Cause I just feel like, oh my God, oh my God, like really? Um, but yeah, so the doctor told me I was obese and I uh, grew up a larger kid. I was usually the large one in the room. Um, they called me the fat Buddha. No, they called me the black Buddha um, because my dad always had my hair like shaved down so I could look like him, which I did. I do look like my dad. Um, but yeah, uh, they would call me the Black Buddha. They would make fun of my weight. Um, and that's honestly where a lot of my sense of humor comes from is because when you're big and you're going through school, people, you already expect people to make fun of you. So you just have to have those comebacks really quick. It makes you witty. It makes you, keeps you on your toes. It makes you very smart. So bigger people, that's why they're usually better than everyone else. That's just the truth. Um, uh, I'm saying this to say that those are the three things that um, I really hated about myself growing up to the point where um, and I've shared this before that I thought about suicide many many times because I, I was a person that experienced homelessness at some times I was juggled around homes um, I was abandoned by if you watch the video I was abandoned by my mom uh, she left us uh, along with my other siblings that came with her so I felt this huge grief in my middle school years while also being obese while also being in the closet um, and being bullied for that so being bullied in three different directions all because of who I was and what I look like. If you notice, all of the other conversations that I've had on my channel, I wasn't so nervous when it came to talking about my blackness. I'm very proud and prideful about my blackness. I love my blackness now. Um, it, it, it makes me so happy to just see black people being themselves, being free, being courageous, being talented, just in all forms. I, I just love my black people. I love my black culture. I love what makes us different. Um, and when it comes to my queerness, the same thing. I love my queerness. I love expressing it in any way that I feel. I love defining it any way, in any way that I want to define it. Um, and being what I want to be and who I want to be without it having to adhere to society or what they say I should be or what that should look like. And so with those two, I am unapologetically black. I am unapologetically queer. When I say those things about my body, it's I'm still convincing myself of those things. You know, you look at me, you're like, really? I would have never guessed, you know, that you have body problems. But even right now, um, I have to consciously tell myself not to pull out my shirt because of how my chest is looking or how be because of how my stomach is looking. Um, I changed my outfit three times before filming this video, being completely honest, um, because I didn't like the way that my body was looking in it. It's, it's still a fight for me. I asked myself, like, I wanted to dive deep into why. Like, I don't know, like, being black in America or anywhere in the world is hard. It, it's fucking, <sighs> not being black is exhausting, but races make it freaking exhausting. Um, and queer, being queer is completely exhausting in all communities, from the black community, from the white community, all communities we get hate. So. But I was able to find so much confidence and love for myself in those realms. But with my body, it still it was so it was so hard, and it's still so hard. And I wanted to explore why, and I just kept asking myself why, 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 and I and I and I wanted to connect dots. My body has been like controlling my life for my entire life. Like it affects everything. Um, that's really what body dysmorphia is. If you're not familiar with body dysmorphia, I will put it on the screen. It affects how well my day will go. I will wake up and look in the mirror and that determines how I feel. It'll determine how hard I'll work. It'll determine what I wear. It'll determine what I eat. It'll determine how I love. It, it just it just controls my life in a, in a very exhausting way. Like my body has a correlation in everything. It has a correlation to why I haven't been posting on YouTube. Uh, it has a correlation to my relationship, my confidence, um, not only when it comes to how I look, but how I feel uh, valued, how I feel worthy, how I make my work, how I make my art. It just affects every avenue of my life. But it wasn't until last year that I realized that my body dysmorphia wasn't just about obesity or how my body looked. It wasn't just about like what I was eating. My body dysmorphia. L last year for the very first time, I shared to the world that I was sexually assaulted. Um, I don't like the R word. Um, it's just, it just sounds very, <laughs> it just sounds very aggressive, but it was that. Um, and it happened several times continuously for, um, for years, I believe. Um, and it was by a family member. And without getting into too many details about it, but it was the very first time that I shared it to the world. I mean, I talked about it with my best friends. I, my family knows about it. 
and it was just the very first time that I said it to strangers. You know, I do this all the time, so you would probably think that this this wasn't like a big deal for me. Like I've shared so much on my channel, but but it was the very first time that I said it. To, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. Oof. Okay guys, I'm, I'm feeling very anxious and I want to get through this video. Um, I want to share and I want to talk about it, but for some reason, something isn't... I need to be more comfortable. So I'm going to... I need to make myself comfortable. Because right now, it's feeling like work. Um, and I think that's what's keeping me from being open. So I'm going to get comfortable. And we're going we're gonna to talk. Okay? So... Let's talk about it. Last year. Last year was the very first time that I shared with the world um, that I was sexually assaulted as a child. Um, I, this isn't a video, I don't, I don't wanna get too deep into the sexual assault. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I just wanna turn this because I don't really wanna see myself. It was, the very time, it was the very first time that I shared with the world that I was sexually assaulted. I've said it out loud before. I've talked about it with a therapist before. I've talked about it with family members and best friends. But for some reason, when I said it out loud, to people that didn't know me and to people that I didn't know loved me, it was, you know, just me being Tariq Ali online, being transparent. <laughs> it was the very first time that I actually felt like a victim. Um, and you can do with that what you want to do. Um, I know a lot of people are going to do think pieces right now with the word victim. People love to do, look, you can do what you want. This is my story and I get to control what I want to say about it. Um, it was the very first time that I felt like a victim. It was the very first time that I felt like, wow, like I felt the weight of it. Um, like, wow, I, I was... I, that happened to me and then after I shared it I just know like a couple of weeks after I had sex um and for the very first time I looked at sex differently I looked at like I was having sex and I felt like I was being violated and I've never felt that like I've never felt I, I just never felt that in my adulthood like having sex where I felt like I was triggered from when I was sexually assaulted as a child But for the very first time after saying it out loud, I was triggered If you've watched me if you've watched some of my videos and you know that I've said several times that I am not huge on sex I don't have a huge libido like you know, I have sex here and there But I don't necessarily love sex like I don't really get why people love sex so much um and I realized that it's not that I'm not a sexual person. It's not that I don't like sex. It's just that I've never seen sex as something that was supposed to be for me. Um, it was never something that... I, I didn't know that it was supposed to be pleasurable for me. I always went into sex thinking that I was doing it for the other person. Um, because every time that I had sex, it was so uncomfortable for me. Um, not in the violating way that I felt it in this moment that I'm saying. But just in all the other times, it was just never... Un comfortable. I was either anxious, thinking about my performance, thinking about my body, how my body looked. Do I look fat? Do they think I looked fat? Um, do they like my body? Is it feeling good for them? I never looked at sex as like, this is something I'm doing because I'm wanting it for me. I'm always thinking about how I'm performing for the other person. And I correlated this. I mean, there's a lot of things that goes into this, but I correlated this with my body dysmorphia because in my sexual assault, my body was taking away from me. And it wasn't mine when I was a child. I was a baby. I was in elementary school and here I was being sexually assaulted in R word by um, someone so much older than me. Um, and I didn't have a say in it. I was young and I just thought, I, I just didn't, I, I don't, I didn't know what was, I knew what was going on, but I wasn't really sure if I had a say in it, I kind of just thought I was just here and I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, because my body was taken away from me at such a young age, I just don't ever feel like it was ever returned to me. I really never had anyone come to me and, and tell me that, like, yeah, it was wrong. And I knew people felt that, like my family, but I never, I don't, I don't know. I just didn't go through the healing process of understanding that. I had a right over my body. Sex was introduced to me so early on in life, like elementary school. The way that it was introduced to me was that somebody's going to come to you, tell you what they want and do it. Um, and you just make sure you do your part. 
You know, you, you don't tell anyone. You just sit there. You just lay there. Um, you make sure that it's good for them. You make sure that they're good. When they want it, you say, yeah. And, and I realized that over time, that mindset stayed. Like, when it came to sex, I didn't think that I had a say. Like, yeah, I can say if I want to have sex or not. But I, I really didn't think that it was something for me. Um, I felt like my body was something that was supposed to be used for other people to enjoy. For other people to feel pleasure. Um, for other people to feel laughter when they want to make fun of me like I never really felt like my body was mine um, and I realized that that was a long-term effect of the sexual assault and not only that that was a sexual assault part but even outside of that while going through that I was going through people making fun of my body and how it looked um, and doctors telling me that it wasn't right family members telling me it wasn't right coming up to me and telling me that I should be going outside because diabetes runs in our family in elementary school and I've told y'all this story before in my other video but just in so many ways that so many people always had so many comments so many opinions um, and so many different rights to my body that I never agreed on. And I think through all of this trauma and all of this stress that I've gone through with my body, my mind had to do something to keep me pushing and to keep me running. And I think in a way, my mind had to separate my body from being mine. I've done so well for myself in my life with the full ride going to college, this YouTube, just everything. I've worked really hard and I needed some sense of self-worth somewhere. I needed some sense of like, I'm good, I'm great. But if I would have kept my body in that circle, it would have, uh, I think that my mind would have felt like it would have depleted me. Like, there's no way that this is me because I'm good. I do good in school. I do good in this. I do good in that. I, I help people. I'm happy. Boom, boom, boom. I felt like in some ways my mind had to create a world where this is all me and my body is over there. Like my body is something I can't control. And because I separated myself from my body, I've created this dynamic with my body where I'm always fighting with it and I'm always tearing it apart because it causes so much stress. I'm always getting mad. Like, why are you doing this? I'll look in the mirror and I'm like, I've worked out four times this week. Why are you? St why? Why? And, and I do this and I look in the mirror like, ugh, like just cooperate with me, please. And so I've, I've just found myself fighting with myself because it doesn't matter what your mind do does. Um, you could separate your, I could separate my body from myself all I want, but it's still a part of me. And I can never really move forward because it's like if I move four steps forward in another uh, area when it comes to my, my blackness and my queerness, I'm coming back. I'm, st I'm, I'm taking four steps back as well because I keep tearing apart my body, which is a part of me. But because my mind separated it, I'm thinking that it's some different entity and hoping that if I bully it just enough, she'll get in line. So I had to reprogram my mind and I had to understand that it's a part of me. And understanding all that trauma and why my body dysmorphia was so deep was important for me to get there. And realizing all these other things when it came to my body was important because if I would have just attributed my body dysmorphia to body image and how it looks in the mirror, I would have thought that just complimenting myself would be good enough. Like, you know, if you just accept how your body looks, then you'll be good and this body dysmorphia will uh, either go away or alleviate and won't be as hard. But my body dysmorphia was rooted in more than just how it looked in a mirror. My body dysmorphia was from all of these different traumas and different directions way beyond how it looks. So that's why even if I lose weight or gain weight, yeah, the body dysmorphia will be triggered in those ways as well, but I had other triggers. And it was important for me to understand those triggers so I could nurture myself and take care of myself in all of those different directions. Um, so that's my experience. So bringing this back, let me move this camera, hold on. <laughs> so bringing this back to a general sense, um, I feel way better now, so <laughs> I'm happy. But bringing this back into a general sense and how we can all move forward from this. The first thing is honesty is very important. You have to be extremely honest and vulnerable and transparent with yourself first. And I emphasize with yourself first because you have to be honest about what you don't like about yourself. And not just something that you think here and there, like you probably think it once a month, but something that is continuously in your mind. Because that's not just disliking something, that's usually hating something. That's something that you wish never existed. My Mimi always said to me when I was younger, we weren't allowed to say hate because she would always say, hate means that you wish something never existed. Um, and I'd be like, I hate flies. <laughs> but like, I knew my body bothered me here and there. Like, yeah, okay. but. I realized that it was a hatred when it became something that was in my mind every single day. Like that's not just something you don't like. You can't help somebody that doesn't want to be helped. 
And if you never accept that you don't like something about yourself or that you hate something about yourself, then you'll never feel the need to get better or to change it. And accepting that hate is what's gonna motivate you to know that I have to continuously work on this. Not work on it once. It's not just saying it like, oh yeah, I'm gonna work on that. And there's just hoping it gets better. Work, what do you do when you go to work? You got a clock in every day. Okay, it takes, it takes labor. <laughs> Working is not just saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna work on that and just hope that it gets better. You have to consciously, in your head, work on it. Talk about it. Think about it. Read about how to do better. Watch more videos maybe. Talk to a friend. Talk to a therapist. The next thing is asking yourself the why. Um, why is such a powerful question because it lets us get to the root of things. It helps us understand how things work, um, what the meaning of things are, and it just, it just gives you the answer. It's very, <laughs> it's very simple. Do I have to explain why? Um, why? <laughs> yes, you do have to explain why. It's such an important question. It's a question that we ask in those early ages of life, like when you're a toddler, we ask why to everything with our parents. Like, oh, it's a red light. Why? Why do we have red lights? Because people have to stop. Why? Why? Because as kids, we don't understand anything. And the only way that we can move forward in this world or as human beings or that we can grow is if we understand the why to things. Um, and I think people get to a certain age and they stop asking why because they feel like they have everything figured out when you never have everything figured out. I'm gonna let you know that right now. You never have everything figured out. There's so much more that you can learn. Um, and when you ask the why to these problems, to your trauma, to your experiences, you start understanding how you can improve them. I don't want to say fix um, because fixing is, is it's problematic. Uh, you don't fix yourself. You grow. We're growing. We're growing on top of our traumas. We don't want to take it away. We want to learn more about it and understand where it comes from so that we can move forward. Did you get this from your parents? Did your parents um, go through this and did they project it onto you and now did you internalize it? Um, did it come from friends? Did it come from social media? Do you see a lot of other people talking about it? So maybe that's why you're starting to think about it yourself. When you understand these things, you also start to understand your triggers. Which brings me to the next thing, which is recognizing your triggers. And this is very important because your triggers are what get you back into that low point. When you understand these triggers, you can even communicate to other people on how they can love you, how they can be there for you, how they can support you. And you also understand your boundaries that you need to make for yourself. Because you know if you go beyond that boundary, you're going to be triggered and you're going to be sad. You're going to fall into depression. You're going to be five steps backwards. Understanding these triggers will help you because it's like maneuvering. Um, it's kind of like figuring out where the lines are. Okay, I have to stay here because if I know if I go over here, that's a trigger for me. That's gonna that's gonna bring me way back, and need to I need to stay on track. So it's very important to recognize your triggers because that's what's gonna keep you healthy and keep you growing. And finally, um, it's very important to be nice to yourself, um, especially with me. Something that's really helping me is consciously affirming and reminding myself when I look in the mirror yes my first thought is to say something about my body and be like Ugh, like be just but I have to in those moments even if I don't believe it stop it Tariq you look good you look beautiful this is your body you love it it's yours when you're having sex and you when I'm when you when I was having sex and and I realized that I was trying to perform for the other person I would stop and be like Tariq this is for you. Do you even want to do this? Are you enjoying this? What do you need to enjoy this? What do you need to feel like you have power and agency over your body right now? Um, it's showing up for yourself like you would show up for someone that you loved. If you wouldn't tear apart someone you loved, your best friend, your, your boyfriend, whoever, if you wouldn't tear them apart, why would you do that to yourself? I feel like sometimes it's, it's so easy to be mean to ourselves um, because there's nobody there to protect us. Like when nobody else is there and we're just looking in the mirror, it's so easy to just sit there and just tear yourself apart because you're like, oh, I'm just making jokes or like this will go away. But no, that hate stays. Just like when that loved one says something mean to you and you didn't forget it, it was five years ago and they forgot, but you still hanging on to it, you hang on to that hate that you show yourself. And that's why it's very important to remember to be nice to yourself. And when you want to be mean, you stop it. We get so much hate from so, much, so, other, so many other people, especially what we're talking about today. I'm talking about my queerness, my blackness, my body. You get so much shame, blame, and judgment and hate. For those things so it's very important that you show up for yourself even before you wait for somebody else to do it validate yourself love yourself and i know it's hard it's easier said than done but you have to remember to be really nice to yourself and kind to yourself in this process of 
exploring your self-hate and analyzing it um, because it can be very hard and that's why I wanted to make this video was because I know it can be hard and I feel like sometimes yeah we realize things that we don't like about ourselves and we know we may hate it about ourselves but we, we keep working on it and we're wondering like months or years later like why is this not getting better like I feel like a lot of people get to a point where they're just like okay this just ain't gonna change it's just this is just who I am when really they just haven't dig deeper enough they haven't asked enough whys they haven't um, realized their triggers because they keep getting set back um, I feel like working on these things and doing these things is what's gonna help you really move forward and I wanted to share my process and how I realized that my body dysmorphia wasn't just about body image and how I look in the mirror understanding these other different things helped me move forward um, and help me love myself more and help me understand what I need to do to move forward and I wanted to share that in hopes that other people can do that as well. This process is going to be extremely hard. It's going to be extremely emotional and it's going to take some time. It's not something that's going to be done in a week, maybe not even a month, maybe not even a year. Uh, it's different for everyone but it's very hard. It's about asking more whys. It's about being nice to yourself. It's about connecting the dots. Um, and that's why it's the road never taken is because it's so hard and it takes so much energy But I promise you it's so worth it because once you get to the other side it, It's a freedom and a happiness that you haven't felt before but you don't have to do it alone That's why I really want to encourage more people to be more honest and be more transparent and be more vulnerable With the people that they love um, and maybe not with someone you love maybe with a psychiatrist or a therapist which I highly recommend and encourage you all to do. And that's why in the next video in this series, this body and health series that you can find in the playlist section on my channel, I'm going to be having a deeper conversation about body dysmorphia and self-hate with a psychiatrist uh, present in the video. <laughs> I thank you all for listening. I thank you all for tuning in, supporting me. Um, my name is Tariq Ali. I love you. I hope you have a great day and I hope that you continue loving yourself. Um, and yeah, have a great day. And yeah, th I think I'm done. I think I'm done. Okay. Uh, love you. Peace.